You've probably never considered the mouthfeel of fat or the bliss points of sugary snacks, but you can be assured that food scientists are considering exactly that in an attempt to make processed food even more irresistible. Here now with more on the science behind our overconsumption, Michael Moss, reporter with the New York Times and author of Salt, Sugar and Fat, How the Food Giants Hooked Us. Welcome to TVO. It's nice to have you here. Thanks for having me. It's a pretty scary story, actually, so let's get into it. These three things, salt, sugar, fat, how did you land on those three evils as the things you wanted to write about? I was actually writing about pathogens, first in peanuts and then hamburger. And one of my most trusted sources in the processed food industry said, look, Michael, as tragic as these contaminants are, if you want to look at something that's making lots of people sick, look at what our industry is intentionally adding to their products with absolute control over them. And he was most tied to the meat industry, so he was first thinking about salt, but that because they, salt is used in copious amounts in processed meat. But then that led to sugar and fat, and it's the holy trinity. It's the holy grail, if you will, of unholy ingredients. Trinity. Well, it's been called that, mm. um, on which the processed food industry survives and focuses so much of their effort. Did I read right? Two hundred and eighty billion dollars a year they do in business. Actually, it's up to if you count processed foods that are delivered to the food uh, restaurant industry, it's up to a trillion dollars a year. Yes, it's a huge it's a huge industry. I'm not going to pretend this is an original question, but I'm sure people want to know. Having written this, do you now change the way you eat? A little bit. I have two kids, boys 8 and 13. So We're you trying can't avoid to it. can't avoid it. They have an incredible sweet tooth. We try to do a few things though, engage them a little bit. The other day my wife Eve set a limit of 5 grams sugar per serving boys in the cereal aisle. And an interesting thing happened. They now, when they go shopping, becomes a bit of an Easter egg hunt for them. They look for those cereals that meet that limit, and they're there. They may have to reach down low, as I explain in the book, or get me to reach up high, because the ones at eye level tend to be the ones most loaded. But they are there, and you can actually make the grocery store work for you rather than it control you. OK, uh, we don't do commercials here, but let me guess. The five grand limit, Lucky Charms, Captain Crunch, Alphabets, Honeycomb. Pretty much rule those out those by aren't happening. far. <laughs> Cheerios, the unsweetened Cheerios, mm -hmm. the ones they started with before they added lots of sugar. Special K, Total they like. Ah, and once a week, I slip them whole oatmeal that I cook myself, actually. And there's an interesting lesson in that, which is, this whole thing about convenience and processed foods is really overhyped. It doesn't take that much extra effort to make things from scratch. And oatmeal is one of those beautiful things where throw it in the pan with a little bit of water or milk, make your coffee, do whatever you're doing, come back to it in a few minutes, and then you can add the raisins, the apple slices, the maple syrup, or the sugar, and you're in control. And that's what it's all about. Well, when you put brown sugar on it, though, that's... You know, but Game you don't over. have to put as much as they do. And this is not a book about don't eat fat, sugar, or salt. Mm -hmm. You couldn't get through my house uh, not eating any of those things. It's not about abstention. It's about moderation. And again, us as consumers being the decision makers about how much, as opposed to the processed food companies and their bottom line. What's your go-to guilty pleasure? Potato chips. Chips. Yeah, I'm a salt guy. So salt Sweets and vinegar. Sweets are okay. Chocolate's no problem. I love cheese, but I think that's actually for as much of the salt in the cheese as the fat. Potato chips. How sophisticated have the industries become in hiding these three things? Well, in you, let's start with the using first. They have on staff some of the smartest scientists I've certainly ever met. I start off the book with a legend in the industry called, his name is Howard Moskowitz, trained in mathematics and experimental psychology at Harvard. And he has designed, he calls them engineered, um, some of the icons in the grocery store. And he walked me through his recent creation of a soda for Dr. Pepper where he had to create a new flavor. 
absolutely amazing what went into that development. He had to take 61 separate formulations, each slightly varying from the next, and then subject those to 3,000 consumer taste testings, threw it all into his computer, did his regression analysis to come up with the very perfect one formula that was guaranteed to fly off the shelves, and he did it. And in spite of all that, new Coke still happened. <laughs> Go figure. We can talk about the Coke Pepsi Wars if you want, because that is one of my favorite parts of the book. Uh, let me come back to it, because yeah. I want to go somewhere else. But I just, I, I know that's one of the things I learned that nothing is left to chance. It is absolutely the most remarkable, and yet there's still some of these big cock ups, right, that happen. Yep, and anyway. on one level, these companies are usually fiercely competitive with each other, but on the other hand, the target is always the consumer. Yeah. Okay, let's start with, of your three evil triplets here, sugar. Yep, I do start with sugar in the book. It's probably the most powerful of the three ingredients because we are all hardwired for sugar. Every one... What does that mean, we're hardwired Every for? one of our 10,000 taste buds in the mouth and even going down the esophagus to the stomach are ready for that sweet taste. The instant it hits your mouth, they send signals to the brain. It races to the pleasure center of the brain which basically says, Michael, that was great. Let's have more of that. Sugar is instant calories, especially kids are hardwired for sugar because they're growing, they need calories, the brain sees sugar as instant growth. Do we infer from that that the manufacturers will try to inject in their products as much sugar as they possibly can? No, not at all, because there's a limit to the amount of sweetness even kids will like. It's much more precise than that. And Howard Moskowitz explained to me that our liking for sugar is looks something like a bell-shaped curve. You can do this experiment yourself, and your viewers can take coffee. If you like sugar and coffee, keep adding sugar until you get to the very perfect amount where you love it. Keep adding more. No good. Keep adding more and you're gonna go, oh, yuck, at some point. So Howard's whole mission as other food scientists is to hit the perfect spot for sugar, the perfect amount, not too much, not too little, and they have a name for it. The bliss point. The bliss what point. What is that? The he bliss coined it. It was actually yeah. a mathematical term that, uh, that a colleague of his coined back in the 70s, totally unrelated to food. Howard was showing him one day his work. He was working at, for the Army at the time, which had a whole different problem. They were trying to get soldiers to eat more in the field rather than to eat less. And Howard was looking at sugar as the one allure that might get them to eat more food. And Howard said, yeah, you know, he's telling, he was telling this, this colleague, yeah, here's the perfect amount, here's what the bell curve is. And this colleague goes, oh, Howard, that's your bliss point. <laughs> and Howard, being a great marketer, goes, oh, yeah, that's wonderful. But mind you, this is an internal term. They don't put these on packages and talk about it externally. It's for themselves. But it really captures what they're going after there. If you hit the bliss point, mm. does that actually encourage you to want to consume more? Yeah, sure. It's going to make you like the product. And again, before we go too far on the evil empire notion of these companies, they make a really strong argument that they never intended to make us obese or otherwise ill. They are doing what one would expect companies to do, which is to make their products as utterly, irresistibly, undeniably attractive, mm -hmm. convenient, and low cost as well. And those are important items because besides taste, salt, sugar, fat are huge miracle ingredients for them on a number of fronts. And so, yeah. They're wanting to make their products as utterly irresistible as possible, and they make no bones about that. How about kids on sugar versus adults on sugar? Difference? Yeah, I mean, kids are learning to eat, and one of the things I was very surprised by was listening to food scientists say to me that the processed food industry is exploiting the biology of the child not necessarily by making soda more sweeter or ice cream more sweeter, but teaching the kids that they can find sweetness throughout the grocery store. And I think that's one of the interesting things that happened, that used, sugar used to be in the dessert aisle, and it has spread to products throughout the grocery store. Bread, pasta sauce, yogurt, of course, 
has become increasingly sweet and it's teaching kids to expect large amounts of sugar in everything they taste and that's setting a pattern for the rest of their life. So ironically when we shove yogurt at kids because we think it's healthier, mm. in fact we're shoving more sugar at them in some cases. The companies really glommed onto yogurt because it has this shimmer of health. Mm -hmm. And yet, when you look at even low-fat yogurt, it can have as much sugar as ice cream per serving, which is really pretty phenomenal. We have this debate in my own home. My wife loves to give our kids yogurt because she's big on calcium. And I go, yeah, but look at the sugar content. They might as well just be eating ice cream. Mm -hmm. Why not? It's the same amount. And I think what nutritionists now realize is, okay, give your kid yogurt, but treat it as a treat, as a dessert, not as a health food that they can just eat, you know, ad infinitum. Going to come to salt in a bit, mm. but I want to do fat next oh. because, I, you know, uh, people can understand why they're attracted to the taste of sugar. People can understand why they're attracted to the taste of salt. Yeah. I don't understand how people think they are attracted to fat, yes. but obviously they are. I certainly am. I, I have to say too that you know, reporting and, and, and researching this book for me was really like being inside a detective story, because I wanted to know that too. I wanted to know why has our cheese consumption tripled since the 1970s to where on average now people are eating as much as 33 pounds of cheese <laughs> per year. It has to do with the fat in the cheese, and in some ways, Fat is even more powerful than sugar, and it goes like this. There actually isn't a taste for fat. It's not one of the five taste senses. It's a feeling, and the industry calls the allure of fat the mouth feel. <laughs> I just had lunch, and I shouldn't be craving, but I'm going to now think about a toasted cheese sandwich and the warm, gooey, not the taste, but the feel of that cheese in my mouth goes straight to the brain, the same pleasure center that sugar does and sending signals, hey, eat that. But it's even trickier because it sneaks up on the brain, especially with fat that's solid. And that's typically, unfortunately for consumers, the bad fat, the saturated fat, the fat that's linked to heart disease is solid. And the brain research shows has trouble identifying a solid fatty food as being fat laden. So it won't send the signals back to, whoa, Michael, wait a minute, you're yeah. getting a lot of this. And by the way, fat has twice the calories as sugar. You better watch out. And especially when you slip fat inside a product so you don't see it. If you can't like see what? the fat, well, again, like cheese now is used as an additive to food all over the grocery store. It's absolutely amazing. They used to make pizza with a little cheese on top. They started stuffing it into the crust. Unseen, unalerting to your brain, it helps take the brakes off your brain's mechanism, defensive mechanisms, but it's there in the mouthfeel telling you to eat more and more. They've done studies also just taking like a soup, they'll float oil on the top, or they'll mix it inside, and when it's floating on the top, you'll actually eat less, and your brain is telling you, I'm getting a lot of calories here from that liquid fat. Really, really interesting, the whole fat thing. Hmm. Okay, if Bliss Point mm -hmm. is just the right amount of sugar to put mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. do they measure mouthfeel in the same way? Is there an ideal point? I mean, you could actually apply Bliss Point to fat, and the and remarkable thing, there is no Bliss Point, or if there is one, it's way up in the world of heavy cream. Sort of think about it, that's usually fat. Um, what they've discovered beyond that, though, is if you take fat, a fatty food, and you add a little bit of sugar, it fools you even more, and it becomes even more invisible to the brain. They've done tests on people, and when you're eating a fatty product that has a bit of sugar in it, you're more apt to underestimate the amount of fat you're consuming. Mm -hmm. And the industry knows that, and certainly today we see so many products with a combination mm. of fat and, uh, and sugar. Okay, the third of the unhealthy trifecta, salt. Why do we love salt? Well, funny thing is we're not born liking salt or craving it in any way. That starts at six months, and I was totally surprised by that. I think the explanation is that you actually need very little Sodium is the part of salt that's tied to high blood pressure, and that's the problem. You actually need very little of that to survive. 
Um, but starting at six months, depending on what your diet is, you can start developing cravings. And recent studies have shown that kids exposed to processed foods starting at six months are much more apt to be licking the salt shaker by the time they're in licking preschool. Licking the salt shaker. I caught my own yeah. kids doing that once, <laughs> I have to tell you. And, and you know, I don't know what I was feeding them, but, but I found that really interesting. The other interesting thing about salt is that we can get unhooked on salt pretty easily. Anybody on a low sodium diet under orders from their doctor will tell you after six weeks, they can't walk into the grocery store without being repelled by many foods. They're gonna to taste too salty. Your threshold of liking for salt goes down and down and down and down. What's really fascinating to me is that, and I get to this in the, in the fat section in the book, which is that while we can get unhooked on salt, the companies are incredibly, irreversibly, irretrievably hooked on salt. It's the miracle ingredient. Salt is a preservative for them. It allows them to create foods that can sit on the shelf for weeks or months at a time. It's cheap, 10 cents a pound. They can avoid using more costly ingredients like fresh herbs and spices. And here's the really beautiful thing for them is it masks some of the off notes, they like to call it, the bad flavors that are inherent to food processing. One of the biggest being meat. When meat is reheated, the fat oxidizes and it emits something that they call warmed over flavor, another wonderful industry term. <laughs> Salt acts as a mask of warmed over flavor. So it's beyond the flavor burst of the taste itself. It's so important to the industry. Now in the, in the way that the industry, I guess, has been incented to take some of the fat out of their products and mm -hmm. trans fats and so on. Yeah. Are we seeing a similar kind of thing happening related to salt? Yeah, we are. And in fact, you're really sort of seeing it across the board in just the last year or two, a number of companies under pressure from the White House, Walmart even has begun forcing companies to cut back on salt, sugar, fat. And yes, salt as well has been one of the most recent sort of concerns that they've been addressing. And a really interesting thing happens is that they will take out 10%, 15%, 20, no problem, because they were adding so much to begin with. They didn't even know why they're adding. It's just so inexpensive, they're not thinking about the amounts. Um, but after that, they start hitting a wall in terms of consumer preference, taste, and their own needs, as I mentioned, for convenience and low cost. And just to illustrate that, I went to see Kellogg in Battle Creek, Michigan. They, and I went to their research and development lab and they gave me a tour and they're, they're very nice. And then they made for me specially prepared versions of some of their icons without salt. And I and the chief food technologist there and a representative of the company sat down in their laboratory and we tasted. And it was just about the most god awful experience I've had recently. <laughs> we started with Cheez Its, you know, nor the crackers. Normally I can eat those day in and day out. I love them. Without salt, we couldn't even swallow them. They stuck to the roof of our mouth. They had no texture, no solvabil sol solubility. Um, we then moved to frozen waffles, we popped them in the toaster and they came out looking and tasting like straw. But here was the clincher, then we went to the cereal, poured some milk over it and we're taking bites. And before I could say anything and kind of ruin the scene, the company spokeswoman said, metal, I taste metal. And it did, the cereal turned metallic. And we turned to the food technician scientist to explain that and he said, well, not everybody tastes this, like I'm not getting a heavy metal taste, but so many people do because it's inherent in kind of the food processing when you add all these minerals and vitamins and, and other sort of laboratory right. things, it creates these you know, metallic tastes and the salt acts as a mask to eliminate those. So, Miracle ingredient does so much to the companies, they are hooked on salt and caught between a rock and a hard place. This next question is a bit off the path, but throughout the book you talk about examples of, of companies that you visited, that they've let you in. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to understand why a company would let a reporter for the New York Times in so that he can ask all sorts of questions about why they're putting all this unhealthy stuff in their food. 
Why did they let you in? I think there's a few reasons. You know, I've been a reporter for 30 plus years. I'm an investing reporter, but I'm very fair. I'm balanced. I empathize. I want to see their point of view. And I had a trove of documents, insider records that detailed for me their pursuit of salt, sugar, fat in their formulations and their marketing that certainly helped me convince some of their top officials to open up more and reveal more of their secrets. And with that in hand, I think the companies just felt compelled that they had to talk in order to get whatever side of their story out there that I hadn't already found through my own reporting. And you do tell it quite fairly, I would say. Thank you. I'd certainly strive to. Okay, let's go into the home stretch here and talk about when you take salt and sugar and fat and you mix these things all together, which mm -hmm. does happen from time to time. Mm -hmm. How addictive is it? We could talk about the potato chip. And let me back up, though. Mm -hmm. There's no word more that the industry hates than the word addictive, the A word. And they argue, rightly perhaps, that food addiction, food cravings, <clears throat> lack some of the technical threshold that narcotic addictions have, withdrawal symptoms, et cetera. Mm -hmm. They prefer irresistible, alluring, craveable, whatever. Then the whole drive on the industry is the same. Again, they want to make their products as attractive as possible. I was sympathetic with them until I visited the head of the National Institutes on Drug Abuse in Washington. Nora Volkow is her name. She's been there for years and years, highly respected. She is a scientist, has done work on neurobiology, and she has studied the effects of both narcotics and highly palatable, highly rich fat sugar foods on the brain. And is convinced that for some of us, which means many people, the most highly fat, highly sugar foods are every bit as addictive as some narcotics. And her advice to them is, stay away entirely. You're not going to be able to stay put eating just a couple of cookies. And moreover, <clears throat> trying to solve the problem for you is going to be harder than drugs because you can't go cold turkey on food like you can mm -hmm. narcotics. She's usually empathetic to that. Um, that said, um, the you know, looking at the drive by the industry in pursuing these perfect amounts, I mean, they spend so much effort formulating, designing, marketing foods, all aimed at finding the very perfect amounts of these products. Because they know when they hit them, we go over the moon and the products fly off the shelves. Mm. But where we discovered in the <clears throat> past several years that the cigarette manufacturers actually injected into their product a chemical that was designed to make you addicted to their product. Do the food folks do that? I spent time with the former president of Coca-Cola North America, Latin America. It was an amazing story. He was one of their top warriors. <clears throat> and he fully understand the targeting of teenagers, kids, fully understand the, um, the super size me phenomena as it played out at Coke, fully understood and was engaged in um, the um, huge war that they had with Pepsi to increase uh, uh, soda consumption. <coughs> Excuse me, when I caught up with him recently, of all things, he's now selling fresh carrots as what he says his karmic debt, <laughs> paying for his 20 years at Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. And he's brilliantly stolen a page of the playbook from the junk food industry using the kind of marketing cunning that they use in selling soda and other snack foods to try to sell carrots to kids, plain old carrots. But he said to me, you know, look, Michael, after walking me through all this incredible insight into how Coke really does it, he said to me, you know, there really isn't a smoking gun here like you might find in the tobacco industry. There's a gun, but it's right there in plain sight. It doesn't hide. And that's the genius of Coke. And that's also the genius of the entire processed food industry. It is what it is in the title. It's salt, sugar, and fat. You know, those are their elements, their pillars. Um, weapons, to some extent, and certainly in the way that they compete with each other for turf in the grocery store, using the amounts and more and more. They would argue that they're using these to feed the world at low cost with convenience. Yeah, but they're but not it dummies. it is what it is. Yeah, they're not dummies. They do know that, you know, just in our last minute here, maybe you could tell me whether you see in them any incentive 
to reduce these three things yeah. which are hurting us. Yeah, I really think we're coming to a tipping point now. The incentive is going to come from consumers who are becoming more aware and more concerned about what we're putting into our bodies. Pushing back is going to be Wall Street. They demand profits. And every time one of these companies tries to do the right thing by consumer health, Wall Street is going to be there watching sales figures and time and again. They've had to pull back from trying to reduce the loads of salt, sugar, fat. So government regulation, maybe. There are some things. I think that I definitely know there's some things that the White House is thinking about doing now to help to level the playing field in the grocery store. But ultimately, I'm hoping this book is empowering to people. If you know what the companies are throwing at you when you walk into the grocery store, that in and of itself, I think, is hugely empowering. And ultimately, we're the ones who decide what to buy, what to eat, and how much. And that's a, that's a huge thing. Hmm. OK, that's day one for us, Michael Moss. I'm going to tease people a little bit by asking them to tune in tomorrow because we're going to take them to Minneapolis, Minnesota in the year 1999 mm. to a previously, until I read about it here, secret meeting among all the big food executives and what they had up their sleeves. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.